Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Strategic Growth Council. Happy Halloween to everybody. Um, I don't see any costumes out there, which is very sad, or up here. Um, I'm sure we all have them to change into as soon as we leave. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, and Doug, you're doing the roll call, is that correct? That's right. Uh, we'll start on the council's left. Do we have uh, Lauren Sanchez for Cali PA? Present. Uh, Lynn Van Cock, uh, Leibert for BCSH. Present. Oh. Aaron Ross with CDFA. Present. Kate Gordon with OPR. I am here. David Kim with CalSTA. Present. Paul Capritz, public member. Present. Wade Crofa, Natural Resources. Here. Yana Olson Morgan, HHS. Present. Bob Fisher. Here. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, everybody. I just wanted to say congratulations to Lauren Sanchez, who was recently put in her position as Deputy Director at EPA, um, coming over from ARB, and is her first SDC meeting. So, welcome. Um, all right. Uh, looking at the minutes from last time, um, take a second to look at those, and then we need a motion on those. If there is one. I'll move. All right. So moved. Any seconds? Second. Uh, just a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposite? Uh, anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Yes. That's you too, right? Abstentions from you guys. You got that? Everybody got that? All right. Thank you. Um, all right, we have um, a lot of things on the agenda today, but before we get into them, um, this is traditionally the moment of the uh, agency report. It's a chance for everyone to, agencies and public members, to talk about things that are happening in their agencies, in their communities that are top of mind, that are related to our unified charge of uh, strategic growth. So I will ask if anyone has any updates. That, oh, Karen Ross, Karen Ross. So we, um, since our last meeting, have given some additional grants from the Climate Smart Agricultural Programs. I'm really pleased to announce that on our methane reduction program, which is dairy digesters and alternative manure management practices, thank you, I'm doing this after lunch, not before lunch. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, we, all we, like we have projects in place that are estimated to reduce methane emissions by more than 25%. So in the third year of this program, we're marching towards that 40% reduction goal um, in a very, very positive way. We also had um, our last round for this year of funding for healthy soils programs. And I had a stack like this on my desk this morning to look at all of them together over the last two and a half years. We have projects all over the state, large, small, some really innovative projects, demonstration projects, some that will collect data, and some are just about showing neighbors what we're doing to broaden the adoption of healthy soils practices. So um, these are fabulous programs, and we look forward to doing more in the future. But I thought um, this methane reduction has been a big goal for all of us, and it's really nice to see the progress that's being made with the projects that have been funded so far. That is awesome. Dirt and manure from CDFA. Very, very, very <laughs> consistent. Awesome. Thank you. Those are, are great programs. And just uh, uh, editorially, we know actually from the Air Resources Board that the manure, that the manure management programs are some of the most effective from a dollars to uh, emissions reduction standpoint. So nice job. Other, David. Thank you and happy Halloween, uh, even though there are no costumes out there. But I can't help it. Um, it is Halloween, so we have to get in the spirit. So I have to ask you a question. Why did the ghost go into the bar? Nice. For the booze. Oh. B O O S. Oh. Yes. Right, right. Oh. Couldn't oh help God. it. It is Halloween. I we knew have to. It would be terrible. I just didn't know how bad. Right. <laughs> we must embrace the spirit. Okay, so um, on, on to a non Halloween item. Um, we just launched the fourth round of the Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program, TIRCP. Very excited about that. Um, we also issued new program guidelines, and thanks to the help of everybody uh, on the Strategic Growth Council, those guidelines now include new criteria to really capture um, uh, the benefits of transit as they pertain to uh, infill housing 
and job placement near transit stations. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, we issued a call for projects on October 18th. The application deadline is January 16th. And then we will um, make grant announcements on April 1st. Yeah. And we're looking at anywhere from 450 to 500 million in transformative transit projects. So very excited about that. And uh, we are also going through a consultation process with interested applicants right now. So um, I just want to mention that for the record. Thanks. Thank you. And if you ever read um, David's uh, speeches that he gives, he always has jokes at the beginning. I have to wonder. Now, now it's clear that you write your own jokes, David. <laughs> Uh, no, that's awesome. Thank you. Those are all very exciting. Um, oh, did you want to just mention really briefly you have a new Caltrans director? Oh, yeah. Caltrans' new director started October 23rd, uh, so eight days ago. His name is Tokes Omi Shakin uh, from Tennessee Department of Transportation. We're really excited to have Tokes on board. He comes with a uh, terrific background and um, national reputation uh, for excellence in transportation planning. He also has a, a strong background in active transportation, walking and biking. And so uh, it's rare for Caltrans to have an outsider as a director. This is one of those times where it made, made a lot of sense. So we're thrilled to have Tokes on board and hopefully you'll have a chance to meet him. Thank you, I'm very excited to meet him, Wade. So I actually had an opportunity to uh, sit in uh, on a meeting with Tokes uh, for the first time today and, and definitely agree with your assessment. We're really excited to have him leading Caltrans. Um, I will mention at the California Natural Resources Agency, uh, we recently announced uh, a round of grants for cultural and natural resources as part of Proposition 68. Uh, very much complements uh, the work of agencies on the Strategic Growth Council. Um, I'm particularly energized by uh, a few grants uh, that are made to uh, tribal nations here in California, uh, really focused on um, enabling their stewardship of lands that they've really uh, lived on and protected for millennia. So that uh, demonstrates progress, uh, at least in our agency, on, uh, on partnering with tribes uh, and, uh, and moving forward with uh, land stewardship. Um, I'll also just mention, this has obviously been a hard uh, couple of weeks across California, uh, given the wildfires and the power shutoffs. And I know we're all mindful of uh, the men and women who are on the front lines uh, battling those wildfires, as well as the impacts uh, on communities of these power shutoffs. Uh, Governor Newsom has literally been day and night uh, around the state, uh, both uh, leading the response effort and then also uh, really understanding from impacted communities uh, just, just uh, how impactful uh, these events have been. So uh, that obviously informs our work as we go forward on the Strategic Growth Council. Thank you, and uh, thanks so much for your agency's leadership, um, especially through CAL FIRE, but on uh, the last couple of weeks, which have been really quite, I mean, this is an unprecedented situation in California to have this happening in both parts of the state, or both north and south and across so many communities and in such a short time span. So it's been uh, a real labor for many people. Thank you. Could I? Oh, oh. I'm down here first and then I'm gonna go. Certainly. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very busy time with housing dollars and programming. Oh, is that better? Yep. Um, so it's a very busy time right now for housing dollars. Um, a bulk of the money that was initiated in um, the legislative cycle starting in 2017 is now really coming to fold. And so HCD has the No Place Like Home, Home Infill Infrastructure Grant, which is of course the recent legislation, and then also another round of Veterans Homeless and Housing Program that are all either on the street now or are imminent. So very, very busy time for HCD and a lot of opportunities for local jurisdictions and developers to be able to put forward housing applications. Um, also, I know Louise is going to speak about this, but also HCD has put out the Pro Housing Framework paper, and so that is out for stakeholder feedback and really is going to shape some of the ways that we think about what best practices can look like at the community level. And then finally, through the Homeless Finance and Coordinating Council, um, just uh, two nights ago, we released the guidelines for the um, 
the HAPS program, which is um, providing another $650 million directly to local governments um, to help them with their homeless programming. And why I bring that up is because one of the requirements of the application that is new in the way that we're looking at homeless dollars is that it requires demonstration of regional collaboration. And so we're really focusing and figuring out kind of what that means and looking to other departments and agencies who have a regional solution or structure in place to kind of really identify what that could look like from a homeless perspective. Thank you. That is great. Thank you so much. That's really exciting that you've integrated that into, yeah. into the program. Yeah, and my apologies. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just um, going to so add excited. on. I was so excited. <laughs> no, unfortunately, um, more solemnly, I just wanted to add on to Secretary Crowfoot's um, update and add that at our agency, we've been collaborating um, with our sister agencies and emergency responders, both at a statewide level and locally, um, as well as uh, affected counties, hospitals, healthcare facilities. And I uh, did want to mention that we've established a non-emergency hotline um, that can be found by visiting our agency website, chhs.ca.gov. Um, and that hotline can be used by callers um, to address sort of common issues that we've seen, such as connecting callers to resources in their communities where they can charge medical devices and medical equipment, um, locating shelters with space, um, receiving transportation assistance, particularly for those who are medically fragile, um, finding open pharmacies as needed. Um, so I just want to sort of put that out there and ask for assistance in pushing out that news um, separately beyond um, the updates to fire, safety, and power shutoff. Um, I also wanted to mention during the last meeting, Secretary Galley had uh, referenced the master plan on aging, and I wanted to provide a brief update. Um, we've met with our partner agencies, housing and transportation, OPR, um, to uh, ensure that we're aligning the goals of the Master Plan on Aging with the broader framework of SGC livable community goals. Um, and just really want to express our ongoing thanks and gratitude for both the time and effort at a staff level, but also the direct engagement and leadership at a secretarial level has been um, tremendously helpful. So on that note, we'll be um, following up with proposed focus forums on several topics. Um, the next stakeholder meeting will be this upcoming Monday. Um, materials should be posted on the um, website shortly. And uh, we have convened a couple subcommittees on research and long-term support services. Um, and our last update for our agency, we also wanted to welcome um, two new directors. We have Dr. Sonia Angel, um, who will be joining as Director of Department of Public Health and State Health Officer and Dave Duncan, who will be uh, joining, who has joined, I'm sorry, they have both started. Um, Dave Duncan is the new director for Emergency Medical uh, Services Authority. So they are both um, kept fairly busy at the moment. <coughs> and that's us for, for the moment. Thank you, and I just have to say, Secretary Galley has been uh, incredibly inspiring during this crisis. I mean, just in terms, of especially of coming up with sort of creative ways to reach communities, that one thing that folks may not know is that the secretary really worked on finding ways to reach in-home support services and care providers, and it's just been incredibly amazing to watch him sort of take, and you all take this and find ways to get the word out and ways to engage people. So thank yeah. you for everything you guys have done. It's yeah. been um, really impressive. No, I, I, like you, have also found it inspiring. It is but I inspiring. <laughs> Um, we're, many of us, most of us are on these daily calls about this situation, uh, and it's very, um, it, I will just say for those not, who don't work for the state, the amount of time and attention and resources and commitment that the state has put into to this is, is really, it, it reminds me at least why we do what we do. So it's, um, it's really inspiring. Uh, public members, Nicole, Bob. Sure, thank you. So. Uh, first of all, I want to continue to thank Louise and her team because uh, they keep coming down to San Diego and talking to our local governments and our regional transportation agency. And I do believe that we're going to see more applications from San Diego coming into the SGC programs. So I view that as a, um, a positive outcome of me being appointed to this board. So we're making progress. Uh, and I, I do, though, just want to say that we, and I think this is uh, not unusual to San Diego that we are still struggling uh, with the idea of how to build out infill communities with transit uh, successfully and the tension with sprawl development. And that conversation is playing out in almost all of 
our city halls and our county of San Diego and our transportation agencies. And I would encourage, just because I'm here with the platform with all of the secretaries, um, you to continue to please uh, come down to San Diego. I mean, obviously, I'm sure other uh, areas would say come down to their community and that's fine. All good, but don't don't forget us down south uh, because there's a lot of value to them hearing from you directly about what the governor's priorities are and why he is committed to climate solutions. And I, it just sort of reinforces some of the messages that other elected officials and leaders are saying, but it helps to just, you know, have a drumbeat of that um, kind of statewide commitment and just having that we're all in this together and we know it's um, that there are resources that can help all of us transition to kind of a clean energy future and in terms of obviously not just the grid but our transportation and housing um, sector. So anyhow, it just I think we're making progress but we still need as much attention and resources as possible. But thank you so much for what's already been done and I'm excited. I mean, San Diegans better apply is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, no, I've been I've been reaching out to mayors and cities, and actually I'm feeling optimistic about that. So um, so that's great news. Thank you to Louise and her team and everybody here. And please still come down to San Diego and talk to us. <laughs> Thank you. And San Diego, I mean Sandag is doing amazing, amazing stuff. We actually just met with them recently. They're um, they come up here sometimes too, which is great. But they're oh no, really we're, they're on fire. Inspiring. The team. They met with and, you yesterday. Yes. Yeah, the executive yeah. director, um, but he needs help because you know yeah. he has 18 member agencies, so yep. member cities, so um, and the county. So there's some you know varying perspectives on next steps. But yes, the I agree. Vision Super, oh, the yeah. vision is amazing. Yeah, for those who haven't seen the Sandag, the regional vision for the regional transportation agency, it's really incredible. Yeah, we could become um, a world class uh, transportation system. So, yeah. so thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I was at a um, Conservation International board meeting uh, last week in Washington, and um, where I we heard a presentation by Johan jo uh, Rockström, who's the chief scientist there and at the Potsdam Institute, and it just reaffirmed for me the urgency of what we're all doing. I mean, we are we don't have a lot of time. We got to move fast. We're behind, and uh, we just got to stay laser focused. There's a huge discussion also on. I mean, given uh, Conservation International's focus, given the the, um, the focus on uh, nature-based solutions, and um, you know, nature can account for 30 percent of of, uh, of of the the improvement of, in climate change. So, um, we it doesn't exactly come under much of what we're doing here. It comes under many of the agencies that are that are sitting up here. I'm not sure exactly how it applies to any of the programs that we've got. Um, it might be worthwhile taking a look, maybe having staff take a look at, at whether the, the nature-based solutions are woven well enough into the policies that we have, but um, we got to keep moving fast. Thank you. That is a great um, reminder of the urgency, but also I think we are, I think many of us work on this all the time, we really are in a moment when land use is being recognized as a major contributor and solution on the transportation side, on the housing side, on the health side, on the agriculture side in terms of nature-based solutions, in terms of resilience. So it's something that has gotten an enormous amount more attention in the last couple of years. And I think we're all up here. That is, I mean, that is strategic growth, right? Strategic growth is as much about how we pre preserve and maintain land and manage land as it is about how we build. So it's um, very relevant, so thank you. Um, just a couple of things from, uh, unless there's anyone else, I think I got everybody. A couple of things from governor's office and, and OPR. Um, David, I thought was gonna talk about this, but since he didn't, um, the, the governor signed since our last meeting an executive order uh, N 1919, which um, is actually very much along the lines of everything we talk about um, in that it, it calls to essentially integrate a, a number of our existing programs across the state with our, uh, to align them with our climate goals. So it calls for our $700 billion in pension investments and UC retirement funds to be better aligned with our climate goals, both in terms of mitigation, but also in terms of climate risk from physical impacts. Uh, so we're working with CalPERS, CalSTRS, and the UC retirement system on that. Uh, calls for um, our Department of General Services to look at our 19 million square feet of buildings and our 51,000 fleet vehicles and align those purchase decisions and leasing decisions more closely with our climate goals, again, both on the physical risk and on the mitigation side. And then really importantly, especially to my next door neighbor here, um, ask the Department of Transportation to align where possible um, uh, funding and, um, and decision making around those goals as well. And so that's a really big 
I think it, it, it is a big statement from the governor that we are looking at climate as something integrated into our operations and decision making across the board and not as a separate set of issues that lives over here. Um, and I think that's very much what this council is about too. So it, it's very exciting. Um, couple other things from OPR, um, just for folks awareness. We just hosted um, a summit, a half day summit on, on grid re reliability and resilience at the Verge Summit in Oakland last week. That was really focused on this sort of, in our role as long-term planners, our focus on beyond the fires, how do we start thinking about um, kind of inter-technologies and structures that'll make the grid more resilient. And there was a lot of great, a lot of entrepreneurs and a number of people from PUC, CEC, ARB and the um, ICE, California ISO in the room. So that was a great kind of state meets entrepreneurs kind of conversation. We're also doing um, technical assistance on uh, mitigating wildfire risk through land use through our general plan process right now. So we have a first draft of that technical assistance coming out shortly. Um, and a working group that includes many of your staff working on that. Um, just something that we do that people often don't know, but it relates to HHS. We have a precision medicine program. And just a quick note on that, we're about to put on an RFP for uh, a new program, which is focused on adverse childhood um, uh, incidents. So ACES, which stands for what? Adverse childhood, somebody remind me at first. Events, right. The, the S is always confusing <laughs> to me. Um, and that's with the Surgeon General that we're doing that. And um, that's very exciting that we're sort of, and we're starting to look, one of the areas in which there's a big overlap between everything we're talking about up here and adverse childhood events is again with these natural, natural disasters. Um, the fires are a mental health crisis as much as a physical health crisis. And so um, that's exciting to kind of be at that intersection with you guys. So thank you. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, but everyone is doing such important work. One of the things I love about this council is how intersectional everything is. Yeah. So thank you guys all for that great work. We could talk about it all day, but instead of doing that, we're gonna to listen to Louise tell us <laughs> what she's doing. Oh, there you go, okay. Uh, well, happy Halloween, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this special day, special holiday. I know everyone is eager to get out trick-or-treating, um, but we do have a couple of uh, big items with um, the HSC and TCC program, so I will try to be quick so we can um, move to that. Um, just wanted to give a few updates of things that are happening at SGC, start sort of uh, with our staffing updates, a few nice program highlights that I'll hit on, and then I will turn over to Sloan to talk about um, sort of outcomes from the legislative session. So first, I am very excited to welcome three three and a half new staff members um, to uh, SGC to help implement our regional climate collaboratives program. And so we have Karen Kumar um, and Sarah Risher who are newly joining SGC. Um, and then Coral Abbott, who many of you know has been part of our AHSC program is moving over into our regional climate collaboratives program. And so this program was established through SB 1072 signed in September of last year, intended to help to one, develop technical assistance guidelines to help build on the models we've been developing through SGC and our other partnerships on how we're engaging and supporting under-resourced communities, and then also to build a program to help support regional climate collaboratives, which are really intended to be building capacity on the ground um, that can serve communities through community-based organizations, local governments, and other partners. So a lot like the collaborative stakeholder structure that we um, look at at the core of TCC, um, this is taking that model and thinking about how do we grow that around the state. Uh, and so we will have more to come on that as the program gets underway, but we're very excited um, to be launching this program and working in partnership uh, with all of you all to do this, uh, to do this work. Um, we also will be are in the process of hiring um, within the AHSC program, one to bring in um, a new member to take on Coral's work around community engagement, technical assistance, and a lot of the outreach that we've been doing um, to help us get out to places like San Diego and others um, to be working with this program. And then we're very excited that we're also gonna be adding an additional staff person into our AHSC team as well. And so that hiring process is underway, and hopefully in December, I will get to introduce you to a couple more people uh, joining us. 
Um, I'm also very excited that we, in the last month, had two groundbreakings as part of our Transform Fresno TCC grant. And so, um, as many of you know, this is our largest TCC grant, just under $70 million, that has gone into Fresno. Includes many, many components to the work. Um, and uh, two, two groundbreakings took place. One was with Grid Alternatives, which is doing solar installations on both multifamily and single family housing units throughout the region um, is also a big work, is part of the workforce development part of that project. And so uh, we were able to go down there, um, see some of the work that's underway, and then also hear about some of the job training outcomes that are already being accomplished uh, through that work. We're also excited um, to think there's a possibility of, um, you know, we're hitting, we're getting close to the million solar roofs uh, milestone, and GRID has been a huge part of that, and so we're very excited about that work. Um, the other was Yosemite Village Urban Farm and Community Garden, which is a seven acre project that sits um, adjoining Yosemite Village, which is um, a, a housing. Um, overseen by the Fresno Housing Authority and also next to a farm worker housing um, location and then adjacent actually also to a foster farms uh, uh, processing facility. And this was seven acres of housing authority land that was vacant. And the residents of Yosemite Village came together and developed a vision for what they wanted to see on this land. And it is going to include a community garden component um, with a walking path that's measured out to be exactly a quarter of a mile so that they can exercise it's also going to have demonstration um, plots where folks can learn permaculture techniques and others and ideally go out and then do um, production farming throughout the valley. So this was just a great pro project. We were there. They had laid out the paths. Um, we ceremoniously planted five bushes. Um, but then that weekend, they had a planting event where the community came out and really started. They had all the um, plants there. And, um, and so it's really, it looks quite different than this picture here. Um, uh, and I just want to say there's just a lot of exciting things happening in Fresno, and I think it's important to reflect on the role that TCC has had in this work. Next week, the California Economic Summit is going to be hosted in Fresno. Um, and that will shine a spotlight on a lot of the work that is happening. There was also a convening uh, two weeks ago that the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco held focusing on community investment in Fresno, and half of that was dedicated to TCC as an, um, an investment to spur a lot of these partnerships that are um, coming up. So just a lot of really exciting work. I know many people are involved in it, um, but it's really great to go down there and just see the partnerships that are happening and the, all of the different groups that are getting engaged. Uh, another TCC milestone that was really exciting was that we had all of our round one grantees decided they wanted to visit one another and see their sites, see the projects they're doing, um, and then sit down and talk with one another about how they're implementing and doing this work. And so this is a, um, from our bus tour in Ontario, where we had a community member talking with us about a lot of the work that has been going on down there and how it came out of the community vision. Um, and so we did, we in each location got to ride around to see the projects. Um, but I think probably one of the best parts of this, and we were talking to one of our um, partners in Fresno, was this information sharing component. And I think it does just point to the value of the peer-to-peer -peer learning and how helpful it is to complement the technical assistance and all of the work that we're doing for communities to be able to talk to one another and ask just very practical questions <laughs> that we might not touch on. And so it was really, I think, a great, um, something we hadn't done before, really great outcomes, and I think something we'll want to try to replicate in the future. Well, just on this, um, Secretary Blumenfeld and I were able to join in uh, Ontario, which was just incredibly fun, and the, particularly the community garden there, which is really, looks much more like a garden than that last picture. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but also just seeing how they're integrating a big housing project, thinking about transportation, thinking about urban greening. It just was a really, and the, the community is just so invested. It was really, um, I just encourage folks, if you have a chance to go on a site visit, to go on a site visit, because it, it brings it, it's much more real when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so that was, uh, was really uh, terrific. And so, and there is, if folks are going down to the Economic Summit, uh, there is actually a component of the summit where they will be touring um, the Fresno, the Transform Fresno project. Um, 
I also want to announce the, um, there was an announcement at um, the, from the Institute of Local Government about the launch of our BOOST program. And I wrote down, as build, organize, optimize, strengthen, and transform. What this is is a technical assistance program that we've launched with the Institute for Local Government. In the 2018-19 budget, within our allocation for technical assistance, we were directed um, to work with the Institute for Local Government with $1 million of that um, appropriation to do technical assistance. And so this is going to be more of a place-based approach where we're not tied to a single program, but instead are going to be working with 10 cities and two regions throughout the state with a focus on disadvantaged communities to really tailor assistance to what the community needs are. Um, and so this is a photo of us at that event um, with the team from East Palo Alto, which is one of the communities uh, we'll be working with. There'll be more on that um, as the kickoff meetings have just been getting underway, but we're really excited. I think this work will also be a very helpful component to feed into how we're thinking about those regional climate collaboratives. So again, sort of really trying to think about how we build more capacity in place in communities around the state. Uh, next Tuesday, we're having a research symposium with our climate change research program. I know many folks in the room have been involved with that. Um, and the focus of the day is going to be on engagement and research and how important it is to bring voices into the research process to ensure that that research is addressing issues and problems that we're trying to solve um, on the ground. We are, we are at capacity and have really excited with a great mix of attendees, including state and local government tribal members and representatives, the research community, of course, community groups and other stakeholders. But it's going to, I think, be a terrific day um, with some lessons that will come out. Um, we're already starting to see engagement practices reflected in a lot more state research programs. And I think this will just continue to advance that conversation. Um, uh, so quick update on our health and all policies team. Uh, we are very excited. Uh, the California Department of Public Health has added two new health and all policies staff. Um, and with the new leadership at CDPH, we have been having a lot of conversations about this continued um, partnership around health and all policies with the Department of Public Health, the Public Health Institute, and then the three positions we will be adding at SGC. Uh, this fall, there's been a lot of activity on the GARE program, the Govern Government Alliance and Racial Equity. Uh, there was a statewide convening in September um, that featured the activities of many of our state members of the Capital Cohort, as um, this work has been happening at the local level for quite a while, and so it's really exciting to see the state um, playing a bigger part in this. And then just three upcoming events I'll get on folks' radar. November 13th, we'll have commencement for the Capital Cohort for the second year of work. Uh, on December 2nd, we had to, re I think we had announced this on a different date at our last meeting, but we had to adjust due to some scheduling conflicts. Uh, we'll be having our equity speaker series where Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, the state's Surgeon General, uh, will be speaking um, at that. And then on December 19th, I know a number of agencies and departments have expressed interest in signing up and joining the capital cohort in a learning year. So going to what we have did in year one. Um, and so this is really sort of the where the starting point for doing GARE work. And we have a number of interested departments and agencies, and there will be an executive briefing um, on that in de on December 19th. So that is most of our SGC updates. And of course, you'll hear about S uh, AHSC and TCC. I did want to, just building on what um, Lynn mentioned already, uh, give a quick update on the pro-housing and where things are. Um, so in the housing legislation, as part of the budget this year, there was direction to develop a designation um, to for a pro-housing designation, which is designed to give an incentive to local jurisdictions um, that to adopt policies that will expedite housing production. And then the further direction was that this designation be integrated into the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, Transformative Climate Communities Program, and the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program at a minimum. So all three of these programs um, have guidelines right now, IIG, 
TCC and AHSC, we have been working together to integrate um, common language that gives a, a signal of the types of policies that we expect to see. Um, and so that was in the guidelines that we'll be um, presenting on today. Uh, this will actually be a, a year-long process, and then the next round we will be uh, incorporating the formal designation. So HCD is leading the process to develop this designation. This is the framework paper that Lynn mentioned, which is right here. Uh, and it is also designed to elicit feedback. And so there's a survey component to this that can be um, uh, returned back to HCD. There will be a regulatory process and a designation anticipated in the summer of 2020. Uh, so we continue to work with HCD as this is rolling out. We've been providing a lot of input on just the different elements of the policy and approach. Um, but I think a, a great place to be um, really thinking about how we align our housing goals with all of everything else we're trying to do on the community development space. Um, and then finally, I just want to flag two items I won't go into detail on today. One is on our place-based funding analysis. We'll provide a further update in December. We've been collecting data, compiling it, and trying to review it. Um, not surprisingly, a challenging undertaking. And so we'll have more to say on that coming in December. And then um, in response to another item that was brought up at our last council meeting and really thinking about sort of strategic direction, um, just want to sort of put a placeholder in for sort of taking a look ahead at 2020 and doing some sort of visioning and priority setting with the council. And so we'll be working, doing a lot of engagement with key staff and working across looking at administration priorities and coming up with some ideas to bring back to the council early in 2020 uh, on that. Um, and so just wanted to flag both of those. Um, and so. With that, that is all I had. I'm happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I will pass it over to Sloan. That's a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah, any questions, clarifications? Just one thing. Um, thank you, Louise. That was fantastic. So uh, I loved hearing that you all did more uh, site visits for TCC. How can we all get notice of those opportunities? The, yes, and those we kept a little, we tried not to outnumber um, oh, okay. the awardees. Yeah, that's that was our, that was our goal. <laughs> no problem. But absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and what is great is um, each of the awardees loves to present the work that they're doing. Um, yeah. And especially like in Fresno, as we're seeing um, these groundbreakings taking place, we'll definitely make folks aware of them. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'm really glad to see that you're doing that. Um, I travel the state a lot to maybe less traveled spaces than other people do. <laughs> uh, but what I love about this program and going to visit these projects, and I would hope that after a few years of funding these, maybe we do a day long meeting of all of the projects together as well as others interested to learn. What I think, um, what I'm so excited about working for Governor Newsom for is that it's about all California, rural and urban California, integration across agencies no matter what, and helping people feel reconnected as Californians. So these are building, I think, much stronger communities just going through the planning process itself, and then doing the implementation, and then being able to help projects wherever they are in the state connect with others and other potential projects will help spur this to start to happen even with less dollars that could be available for this. I think it's a transformational moment of thinking about that kind of connection beyond what we've already started to do, but never underestimate the value of helping Californians feeling connected together as Californians in a state as large and diverse as ours. So kudos to you for doing that kind of work. Well, and just a quick spoiler alert, which is we are planning um, in early 2020, uh, don't have a date set yet, to bring together our TCC planning grantees, um, implementation grant grantees, and others, because we're obviously not the only ones uh, who are doing this work, because I think the value of a site visit can't be, I don't think, overstated just to see the work and to hear from the community. And so what we want to do is try to bring those voices to Sacramento so more people can hear because we recognize not everybody can get out to see all of this work, but we want to figure we want to bring 
them here to be able to talk about what they're doing, um, how they're working together, the partnerships and collaboration that is happening on the ground. Um, and so that is something we are working on for next year. Yeah. Just to echo what uh, Karen just said, um, you know, we, and just because ver by virtue of Regions Rise and other projects, I also get to travel around a lot, which is great. And the, the value of having state leadership go to places is, is really, although I am very excited about having everybody here because then they can all be with each other and you create the community of practice and it's really important. Getting out to these communities is, um, it's really important because it also just informs all of our work, like not just this SGC work, but um, to all of our work to see how this stuff, the stuff that we fund and implement and think about all the time is actually uh, working or not working um, in, in the field. And just to that, to that end, I was wondering if it would be, I mean, it's probably hard, but if there's any way to do like a quarterly calendar or something so that we could mm -hmm. see the next three months of potential openings and site visits so that people could, because all of us I know just need to plan way ahead and on our calendars, but it would be really nice to be able to see, oh, I'm already gonna be down in Fresno, I'm gonna be down in Merced, this is a good intersection with this thing that's happening for SGC, I think that'd be really helpful. Yes, yeah, I think we can certainly do that, especially for events we are planning, uh, and we will do our best on uh, other events as they come up often, they come up quickly, um, but we will absolutely uh, work to try to synthesize that information for everybody. Other thoughts, questions for Louise, questions for the staff? All right, Sloan is in the house for a ledge update. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sloan Viola, legislative director here with a legislative update for you. Um, this year, like any year, was a busy, busy legislative session. Um, there were 2,625 bills introduced. Um, of those, 1,042 were sent to the governor for his consideration, and he signed 870 of those bills. <laughs> um, and so two of these bills uh, directly affect Strategic Growth Council programs. The first, AB 285 by Assemblywoman Laura Friedman, um, relates to the California Transportation Plan. And it specifically directs the council to prepare a report that explores how regional transportation planning efforts influence the configuration of a statewide multimodal transportation system, and also investigate how state transportation and housing grant programs could be better aligned and coordinated. Um, the legislation specifically referenced uh, affordable housing and sustainable communities, as well as the transformative climate communities as part of this. Um, report, but the council also has the ability to look at other statewide transportation and housing grant programs in this assessment. The other bill directly relevant to our programs is SB 351 by Senator Hurtado, and this bill requires the Transformative Climate Communities Program to consider applications from disadvantaged unincorporated communities. Two other bills affect how we operate. Um, AB 1013 by um, Assemblymember Obernolte um, adjust how um, state grant programs may select grant reviewers. Um, it does not allow a, a grant making agency to select a reviewer who has previously served as a member, um, staff member, voting member, or representative of an organization um, if they are reviewing an application from that organization. Um, however, it, uh, this does not apply if they haven't been associated with that organization more than two years prior. And it also doesn't apply to members of public agencies or if that person was an unpaid volunteer of the organization. And AB 1237 by Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry um, relates to greenhouse gas reduction fund program um, grant requirements. And it requires that agencies that administer GGRF funds to post information about the program and the funding guidelines on their website. So this includes information about program eligibility, application and award timelines, agency contact information, whether there are disadvantaged community set-asides, um, and if there are any additional criteria that might give one application preference over another. And we were already doing both these things, right? Correct. <laughs> um, our, our, I've been assured that our programs are taking uh, every step to make sure that we are very transparent about how our programs are run and also ensuring that there aren't any potential for conflicts of interest with our grant reviews. But with these now in statute, we're just going to continue that practice. Yes. <laughs> and that is all I have for you. Are there any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sloan. And uh, 
just a little shout out, Sloan does ledge for both OPR and SGC, and it is an insane amount of work given how many bills were, were named in, one or the other of us is named in, so thank you for everything that you do. Um, all right, getting to the meat of the agenda, um, first uh, action item on uh, AHSC program, um, final draft guidelines, and I assume there's a presentation. I do have a number of comments on this, but I'm gonna do those at the end of the presentation and discussion. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you. I'm Ryan Silber. I'm the program manager at SGC for the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, just going to give a quick overview of the program's intents, outcomes, and uh, goals. As then we're gonna just show some of the more major changes that we're proposing for the guidelines uh, this round. So uh, AHSC is a climate change investment program. Uh, as of a few years ago with SB 862, we have a continuous appropriation of the GGRF funds or the cap and trade funds at 20%. Uh, we're tasked with implementing SB 375, which is uh, sustainable community strategies as well as the Global Warming Solutions Act through a number of strategies including land use, housing, and transportation options. Uh, how we actually do this is through investments in a couple of categories. What this chart works out to be is about over the past four rounds, 75% of our funds have gone towards housing investments and about 25% towards transportation investments and about 1% there for different programs types uh, in the communities. Uh, what this really works out to look like is uh, going to be shown through this cartoon here. I think as some of you have seen this before in past rounds. Uh, we can add a little flair though with explaining this through an actual project we funded. Uh, this project is the Las Ventanas uh, housing development in Long Beach. So this award included 101 affordable units in Long Beach near the Metro Blue Line, which is uh, a major transit corridor in the region. About 15 of those units were, support, or were supportive housing units. Uh, it also included expansion of bike lanes by closing some key gaps uh, that really prevented safe access to existing bike lanes. There's also a green alleyway created to uh, turn into, or an existing alleyway created to turn into a green alleyway for pedestrian and bicycle access. Uh, major uh, bus shelters were added towards a major transportation hub that included a lot of connecting lines uh, and increased the accessibility uh, of that line. Uh, sidewalk expansions and creating a more complete street environment by including tra er, traffic calming measures like pedestrian bulb outs and also urban greening in and around the transit station area and lighting uh, to make that transit station more accessible uh, throughout the day and night. So what we've done so far is through four rounds, we have awarded 101 projects at over $1 billion. Uh, that includes over 8,000, almost 9,000 affordable units. Uh, an additional 700 market rate units were supported at these same developments. Uh, of those units, uh, we had 1,800 of them were supportive housing, uh, 600, over 600 were senior housing, and nearly 500 units were for veterans. So uh, where we are at right now is many of these projects are still in progress of being built out, though we've seen about a third of them actually reach completion, so uh, a lot of this work coming to fruition. I wish I had some more statistics about the other project components, but we see a lot of variability in the types of AHSC projects. So lots of transit routes expanded, sidewalks and bike lanes added, urban greening projects and different types of programming, including free transit passes and more recently workforce development programs. And 81 of these 101 projects are taking place in disadvantaged communities. So really taking uh, through that vision of sustainable development anchored by affordable housing to make sure folks can stay in place to experience the, these changes in their neighborhood. So some of the changes we have proposed for the round five guidelines, uh, most of them were uh, just quick changes, but just going to cover some of the substantial ones here. Uh, so for program design, uh, probably our most substantial change this round is we are proposing a 10% funding target increase to our integrated connectivity projects. Uh, 
So we have three different project types. ICP uh, is one of them. They all essentially have the same funding components, but they're defined based on the type of transit they're proximate to. So all of them are near quality transit, uh, though our ICP projects are not near uh, fixed rail or dedicated bus lines, uh, and they're not in rural areas, which define those other two categories. So by geography, this covers the majority of the state that's eligible for AHSC programming. Uh, what that looks like is about 60% of our funds over the past two rounds have come in the form of our ICP category, uh, while we only have a 35% funding target. So highly competitive, definitely the most competitive of all of our project area types. It's also been our top comment from stakeholders over the past three rounds is that this area or this project type is too competitive and that we're facing attrition in areas of the state that choose not to apply because they perceive the uh, it's too uh, too low likelihood of being awarded funds because the uh, the ICP areas also include those major metropolitan areas that qualify with that high quality transit uh, so they're going up against uh, some high resource communities uh, but I think at the core of this is the underlying issue that we're going to be experiencing in California, the majority of our growth in areas uh, that are outside of our major metropolitan areas. And we need to be thinking about how we support sustainable growth in these areas. Uh, what AHSC can do is serve as a pilot of sorts for what sustainable development can look like and how to achieve infill and transit oriented and walkable communities in areas of the state that tend to have less dense development and don't support infill. Uh, we've seen this through many examples and heard many stories about how AHSC uh, has been successful and then that this establishes lasting connections between different transit agencies, housing authorities, public works departments, and housing developers. Uh, even just two days ago at the CTC Active Transportation Symposium, there was a planner on a panel from the, formerly of the city of Santa Ana who called out AHSC for bringing together those different local planning agencies, uh, saying that they had never really sat down at the table before and that those uh, connections are now lasting. So we're really hoping that AHSC can serve to uh, change planning dynamics in local communities. Uh, as a result of increasing the project area funding target from 35% to 45%, we would decrease our discretionary funding from 20% to 10%. This round, that would still mean 55 million in discretionary funds, uh, which is a fairly substantial amount. Uh, but it would provide a little bit more transparency to our applicants on how our funds will be awarded via this competitive process. Uh, another uh, fairly substantial change and one we're very happy to present on is that we are proposing a tribal funding target. Uh, so AHSC introduced tribal eligibility uh, a few rounds ago, though we haven't actually seen a tribal applicant yet. And we've had some concerted technical assistance efforts to try and get uh, uh, tribal communities interest in the program, which we've seen, but similar to the ICP category, their uh, ideas that uh, the competitiveness and uh, competition against high resource applicants is still a barrier. So by providing a funding target, which would be funding one fully eligible tribal applicant that meets all of our threshold criteria and our minimum scoring requirements, uh, awarding the highest scoring tribal applicant. Uh, as a result, uh, we have actually had a lot of interest so far from tribal communities who are stating their intent to apply and hoping that this funding target will break down that barrier and also lend to this idea that these AHSC, AHSC style developments are uh, possible in all sorts of communities can really serve some of our most impacted communities across the state. We're also proposing an increase to our maximum award amount. Uh, where it was previously at $20 million, we are proposing going up to $30 million. The idea behind here is in alignment with other state housing funding sources. Uh, other HCD uh, loan programs are increasing their maximum loan amount to $20 million. And what we're trying to see across these different programs is uh, an easy switch between programs if a project is not eligible or not awarded within one, it can apply to another related program. Uh, if AHSC didn't increase its maximum award amounts, uh, we 
our applicants would continue to use some of their funds for transportation asks and where projects they're requesting $20 million in other HCD programs, they couldn't then switch to AHSC or they would switch their AHSC funding request. Uh, so increasing to $30 million essentially allows these projects to apply consistently with the same housing request across different programs. Uh, aligned with this, we are uh, suggesting a, a, an increase to our maximum developer uh, funding, uh, where it was at tw or 40 million, we we're suggesting it be raised to 60 million. Uh, this would be consistent with two maximum awards uh, across all of our rounds. Uh, HSC uh, has, uh, is statutorily required to fund at least 50% of its total funding towards housing projects. And in recent rounds, we've seen uh, the funding mix start to slightly increase in transportation funding. Uh, so we, were, we are suggesting that we increase or establish a minimum housing funding request across all projects at 50% of total funds requested. Uh, realizing we're in the midst of an affordability crisis that AHSC is statutorily stated to be a housing uh, program at its core uh, for GHG reductions, uh, we want to ensure that housing remains uh, central to each of our AHSC projects. Uh, really matching this uh, is establishing a maximum transportation funding request at $10 million. This would impact very few of our previous applicants. So retroactively, a uh, few of our applicants would have hit this $10 million cap. Uh, but considering our $20 million maximum loan amount, uh, projects that uh, are a little bit smaller in housing uh, would then be limited to a still this $10 million maximum funding request and wouldn't essentially those larger projects wouldn't be impacted by being able to only request a smaller housing funding portion. So keeping that maximum transportation request level across smaller and larger projects. Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach to transit agencies over this past off season of sorts, uh, realizing that they are essential partners to our HSC applications. We wanna make sure they're staying engaged around housing projects and uh, community improvement and specifically with AHSC. Uh, one of the common pieces of feedback we received is that there's a real funding need for transit operations in many cases and often not transit capital. So to really ensure that they stay engaged, we're proposing uh, a pilot of sorts that we fund transit operations for a maximum of two years, only for new and expanded service, which is the same requirement we impose upon our transit capital improvements. Uh, so two years uh, isn't too much time, but hoping it brings more transit agencies to the table and keeps existing transit agencies engaged. Uh, and we'll reevaluate next round to see what the impact has been on the program. Uh, we just have a few scoring changes uh, to go over. We really are trying to keep our scoring criteria relatively consistent from round to round so our applicants can uh, prepare for future rounds in this long pipeline that it takes to apply for AHSC. So as uh, Luis mentioned, we have pro-housing policies in our guidelines uh, consistent with the IIG programs and the TCC programs. Essentially, these are a soft rollout of sorts ahead of HCD's pro-housing criteria that's coming out in the next year or two. Uh, these five policies that are each eligible for one point up to a maximum of two points are what were deemed as very proven and effective strategies at increasing local housing supply. So this would be two points out of our 100 total points for pro-housing policies. Uh, those two points had to come from somewhere. Uh, so what we started off by doing was evaluating which uh, points were at least utilized by applicants, uh, trying to figure out which maybe are not incentivizing uh, different development types. Uh, where we came across uh, were high-speed rail station planning areas uh, and using other climate change investment funds. So rather than eliminating those criteria, we combine them to make it so these two criteria are eligible for the same point, providing an either or style criteria. 
uh, realizing that high-speed rail, environmentally cleared high-speed rail areas only apply to about four communities as of last round uh, and are often rather of coincidence uh, than uh, specific planning for AHSC projects, uh, uh, especially so for the climate change investment programs where many of our projects uh, are not uh, diverted to AHSC because they have other climate change investment programs, but it's just the nature of the style of development that they may have them. And across the past few rounds, not many projects were uh, able to qualify for either of these points. So it's really providing just greater flexibility and scoring for applicants. Our other point uh, we're proposing to adjust is we are suggesting we eliminate our lowest tier of leverage fund scoring. So previously on this table, it used to go up to five points uh, with one point being for 25 to 49% of leverage funds to the project. Uh, last two rounds, no applicants scored this low. Everyone scored uh, at least two points in this category. So by eliminating this, we would maintain the same spread across all projects in previous rounds. Uh, and really it's a signal that we want to see leverage projects come in. We want to see these climate change investment dollars stretched further. Ryan, can you go back to the list of the pro housing requirements for a second? Thank you, I just wanted to check something, thanks. Uh, our final adjustment is to our active transportation scoring criteria. This is uh, often commented on uh, from round to round, and our existing criteria put a lot of emphasis on length of sidewalk and length of bikeway improvements. Uh, so what we've heard over the past couple rounds from transportation planners and advocates is that this often encourages uh, fulfilling those length requirements, but maybe at the detriment to using active transportation funds for more impactful projects, such as closing key gaps and providing connectivity to existing networks. So what we're suggesting now is removing one point from each of our sidewalk length and bikeway lengths. So moving from three points to two points for each of those and adding that point to closing safe or addressing barriers to safe access for sidewalks and for bicyclists. Uh, so really providing a little bit more flexibility for our applicants to pursue projects that are barriers to existing networks uh, while not requiring that they go and pursue long lengths of pedestrian networks and bicycle networks where maybe uh, it's more impactful to address existing connectivity. Uh, so those, that's the summary of changes we have proposed. Uh, here's the timeline that we've really gone into this with uh, we really kicked off our application or our guidelines review by interviewing our unsuccessful applicants from the past round and hearing feedback from them and issuing a two-week public comment period to hear what changes uh, our applicants wanted to see from the past round. We then convened an interagency working group comprised primarily of HCD and SGC staff with CARB consultation and uh, interviewed a number of subject matter experts. Uh, each of the agencies on the panel or on our council is represented through our interviews with subject matter experts, uh, usually at the department level. Uh, we then released our draft guidelines with a 30-day public comment period and three draft guidelines workshops, including a web or not including uh, a fourth workshop via webinar. Uh, following the feedback and incorporating that, we've now released our final draft guidelines uh, for your consideration of approval. Uh, considering that it, they are approved, we would release our notice of funding availability tomorrow uh, and go on a workshop tour in two weeks and three weeks time to six locations across the state and have a webinar as well. And matching our uh, cycle from last round and doing this annual cycle of applications due in February with awards announced in June. Uh, so our recommendation from the staff is that uh, you as a council adopt our final draft round five AHSC guidelines. I can answer uh, any questions you all have. Thanks, I think what I wanna do is do technical questions or clarification questions for Ryan and then do public comment and then we can discuss um, after the public comment just because there's probably stuff people wanna make sure is in our 
decisions. Um, so questions for Ryan on any of the changes. I know we've all been briefed on these individually too, so yeah. I have a, a minor question. Do we put any sort of requirement currently on the workforce development component? Uh, so no requirement, though we do award two points for a workforce development strategy, such as partnership, er, partnership with a local workforce development board or mm -hmm. doing local hire strategies. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's also a prevailing wage uh, section, right, of the guidelines? Yeah, essentially that uh, prevailing wage applies when it does. Other questions from the council? All right, we may have more after public comment. Thank you, Ryan, great presentation as always. Um, all right, I have a number of comments on this item and I'm gonna call them in the order I got them up here. So Hassan Madanat, it looks like. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm Sosin? Oh, it, it looks like a J, yeah, the I way you wrote it. Must have wrote it really <laughs> Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, Chair Gordon, members of the council. My name is Sosin Madanat. I'm here today on behalf of Habitat for Humanity California. Um, as many of you know, Habitat for Humanity is a nonprofit organization that brings people together to revitalize neighborhoods, build affordable and sustainable housing solutions, and empower families through home ownership. Um, what you may not know is that four of our largest affiliates, predominantly in the Bay Area, but some in Southern California, um, are building multifamily, higher density housing. Um, in, in these larger cities due to the high costs and limited availability of the land. Um, many of the properties that, that they have in the pipeline are very close to transit. For example, a 42 unit um, building or project right across from the Pleasant Hill BART station in Walnut Creek. Um, we've got a 77 unit project in Alameda close to a bus line and ferry stop and an 86 unit development in Oakland next to BART. So when this project first, or when this process first started, Habitat affiliates were very excited about the opportunity to apply for funding. Um, we've had only one uh, affiliate ever successfully apply for and receive funding, um, and they had to go through significant um, hoops and make significant changes to the project, reducing community space um, in order to apply for that. Many of our affiliates do not have the resources nor the capacity to fully understand and go through the guideline process. So we're thankful for the opportunity that the council's provided um, for, for technical assistance and those workshops. But I will say that a number of our affiliates are not eligible for the program. And um, we really are trying to reduce our VMTs. Um, we are serving larger families in these higher density units. Um, and really are serving under, uh, you know, underrepresented low-income communities, which really is within the mission of this organization and, and AHSC itself. So while we appreciate the willingness of staff to meet and consider our comments in the last few rounds and the changes that have made, namely the AMI increase up to 80% was very helpful in many ways, um, we're still facing significant um, barriers in order to receiving this funding. Um, Primarily one is the funding and home ownership projects are not eligible for LIHTC credits. And the timing that LIHTC credits are um, eligible and when rental projects are eligible to receive those coincides with the AHSC application process. Um, while we are eligible for Cal Home Money, that then comes after the application project process for AHSC. And so we're put at a dis disadvantage um, in a number of ways in terms of the leverageable funding. Um, and I'd also say density, um, as I said, we are trying to build higher density units, but we, we've been asking for quite a few rounds now to do bedroom units versus, to do bedrooms versus units when um, measuring the density. Because we are housing families, there are more, more people within those, um, within those units that we could arguably say have a higher VMT because of you know, what they do as a family. Um, we're really, it, it appears that we're disincentivizing and discouraging families who really want to own a home and create that um, equity in, their, in themselves and their families from um, being eligible to, to live near transit. So our goals are the same, as I said. Um, we wanna actively comply with GHG reduction goals and encourage Californians, many of them low-income and disadvantaged communities, to use public transit, which is why we are building many of our TOD projects. Um, 
And, um, but the guidelines continue to be too restrictive and, and rental centric. So um, we just ask that there be a home ownership set aside, maybe similar to what is being done for the tribal, so that at least one of our projects would be eligible and could be considered separately because we face very significant challenges. So I appreciate your time and consideration. We look forward to continued conversations. Thank you Thanks. so much, um, Susan, for your uh, for your comments. Um, and uh, and I should have said at the beginning, and it's why I didn't stop you, is that we we are trying to do three minutes per speaker. But thank you for for those really important comments. Really quick question that I have following up on that to staff, which is just I know we have talked a lot about, and you have thought a lot about the application process and how to make it easier for people. Can you just talk a little bit about what you're thinking on that in this round? Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess a few things, I'll touch on a few that Ryan mentioned, you know, I think some of the, the consistency in, in the funding amount to allow for an easier handoff of, across programs. We've also been talking a lot with HCD in terms of the timeline of programs and so, you know, how they line up over the course of a, a year that could allow program projects to potentially move among programs as it makes sense. Um, I think it is a, a continued work in progress to think about how we fit all of the different programs together to minimize the wait time between pro programs if you're not successful in one moving to the other. And I don't know, Lynn may have more to say on that too, or, or Ryan. Yeah, I know I think that's that's exactly right. There there are a lot of discussions about kind of how to decrease the um, or how to increase the predictability across the process as well. So if you're applying, if you're predicating your your financial solution on public dollars, how do you increase the predictability that you're going to be successful across two to three different pots of money? And how do you decrease the time? Because we know that added time increases the cost of developing housing. Um, so I think those are really, really important questions. And I think there, there's a lot of conversation. Um, I wouldn't say that we're like there at the solution yet, but I think it's a very known and understood issue at this point. Yeah, and on, sorry, on the uh, application material side, realizing that it's a large burden to address all these materials. Uh, we're looking across different uh, housing funding programs, trying to align criteria. Uh, if they we're asking for the same thing, to do it in similar manners, at least. Uh, HCD has instituted, they have their universal application, which is continuously a work in progress to make a single application for uh, all the different housing types. Uh, there has to be some supplement to it, but to simplify that as much as possible. Uh, I have to give a shout out to our colleagues at the Air Resources Board for uh, definitely simplifying our quantification of GHGs and consolidating the different materials into one single tool. So, uh, you know, it's continuously a work in progress uh, and we really wanna make sure these funds are accessible to all communities of different capacities. And our technical assistance program has been instrumental to our success uh, across the state. Uh, you know, without it, it's you know, a fix that's, you know, on uh, for an individual project, but with those potential lasting implications for what it does to the local planning processes. And I'm excited to see uh, how our regional climate collaboratives can build local capacity in uh, a continued manner as well. And, and that's just, I'd like to elaborate on that point as well, because I think it's really important, because in addition to the timing, there's a lot of work in terms of uh, making sure that if, if you're eligible for, say, an HCD project, that you'll be eligible for an HFA, and then uh, also a, um, a tax credit. And I know there's been a lot of great work done between CalHFA and then also um, looking at tax credits, where those applications are essentially identical at this point. And I think that that is really something we should consider continuing to expand. Um, and then also um, through the last round of guidelines with the um, multi-housing program, MHP, there's also significant work to be able to further link those requirements with the tax credit requirements. So I think we're starting to see some organic movement in that way and just need to really continue to move down that direction. Great, thank you. Um, and again, thanks for, for your comments. I have Christine Williams from Enterprise Community Partners. Good 
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Christine Williams. I'm here, as you mentioned, on behalf of Enterprise Community Partners. We're a nationwide nonprofit organization, um, mostly oriented around affordable housing. And we've been engaged with the, this specific program since its inception, both as a lead TA provider in past rounds and in this upcoming round. Um, so I wanted to be here today to express Enterprise's appreciation for all of the conversations and work on behalf of yourselves and staff that went into the the guideline version you're voting on today. Um, first, we really wanted to commend staff for taking the time to have focused sit-down sessions with different stakeholders and then taking that feedback and really using it to further enhance and develop the guidelines. Um, they've been doing this in the last couple rounds and we uh, commend them for that. And we were really pleased to see the following uh, sort of evolving points made in this recent addition. So the first is the additional 10% program set aside that's being allocated to ICP project area types. Uh, we were happy to see loan amounts updated to match other HCD funding sources that really keeps this program um, as a viable option for those looking to finance their developments. And we're really excited there's an explicit effort being made to bring in some tribal applications and see some success there. Um, with some of our additional TA providers, we're already engaging in conversations with folks across the state um, from tribal communities. We also wanted to flag two specific items uh, that we believe could continue to be further strengthened and we're looking forward to participating in conversations on these items. The first is continuing to look at the active transportation scoring section to really ensure that substantive and meaningful infrastructure improvements are being incentivized and incorporated into project scopes. And then second, ensuring program staff are monitoring the impact and outcome of the new pro-housing scoring section. We just want to be sure that the inclusion of this new sort of policy initiative isn't going to disparately impact applications that are coming out of some of the disadvantaged communities that this program is really looking to invest funds in. Um, so we look forward to continuing conversations around those and other items as this program continues to evolve and I want to thank you all for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for your work in this area as well. Uh, I have Alicia Sebastian from the California Coalition for Rural Housing. Good afternoon, Alicia Sebastian. I'm the Associate Director with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. CCRH is a member of the Rural Smart Growth Task Force, and we are also a member of the Sacramento Housing Alliance. CCRH members serve rural farm worker and American Indian tribal communities, and over half of our members also develop in more traditionally urban communities as well. Uh, we're super grateful for the ongoing opportunity to serve as technical assistance partners with SGC. Uh, we thank SGC and HCD staff for their incredible work in round four and in preparing for round five. We've had consistent ongoing engagement as we all work together to create an impactful program. We support many of the changes proposed in round five. We are ecstatic to see an explicit effort to support tribal community applications. SGC, HCD, and our tribal partners have been working together for five years to bring AHSC's catalyzing resources into tribal communities, and we're confident that we will soon see the fruits of these shared efforts. So again, thank you so much on behalf of all of the folks who have worked so hard for this. We're also grateful that SGC has set aside an additional 10% to ICP area types and to see that loan amounts have been updated to match other HCD funding sources. Again, incredible efforts there. We still have serious concerns, however, about the state's pro-housing initiatives, and we expect that SGC, HCD, and other state agencies will closely monitor the impact of these initiatives on rural, farm worker, tribal, and other disadvantaged communities across the state in regards to their access to these critical resources. Uh, like Habitat, we continue to advocate for changes to density definition and calculation within this program. We've had many comments on this and we're happy to go into further detail at another time. In general, CCRH looks forward to working in ongoing partnership with SGC to ensure that AHSC meets the unique needs of the communities we serve so that all of California's communities can engage in meeting the state's climate goals. Thank you. Thank you um, for those comments, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, Julia Jordan, I have from Leadership Council, I have you for two things. So I'm gonna call you up on the first one and then call you back again on the second one later. Is that all right?
Thank you. Um, so yes, Julia Jordan, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. I'm a policy coordinator. Um, and I just wanted to make some brief comments on the HSC program and I'll be back for TCC. Um, but thank you again for your work on developing the guidelines and for um, <clears throat> all the work that you've clearly, staff has clearly put into to getting these together. Um, I, I wanted to also sort of echo the thanks for and appreciation for including tribal communities, as well as increasing the um, ICP category by 10%, which was something that we had um, hoped to see and are pleased to see. Um, and I also wanted to, um, and we're also a member of the Rural Smart Growth Task Force as well, um, and the California Environmental Justice Alliance. So just wanted to say that as well. Um, but in terms of pro-housing policies, um, we wanted to sort of also emphasize the need as we're starting to integrate this into the programs um, in SGC through all three that have been identified today um, to really kind of make sure that we're also keeping in mind the importance of integrating anti-displacement measures, integrating um, you know tenants' rights, just cause policies, things that are really gonna ensure that in the hopes of production and increasing housing supply that we're also still um, inherently in that process, keeping um, you know justice and equity at the front in the forefront of that, um, which also includes considering the value of preservation of housing as well as safe and affordable and quality housing. So um, you know, in addition to expanding the amount, really being sure that we're talking about safe and quality affordable housing as well. Um, and particularly, you know, with with an emphasis on uh, low income communities and communities of color. So, just wanted to make those brief comments. And again, thank you so much for for your work on this. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for all your hard work on all of those issues. Um, those were my uh, public comments um, in this area. So I am going to open it to the council for discussion. David. I simply wanted to applaud the inclusion of transit operations for two years. This is a significant change, and I think it will go a long way towards uh, generating even greater interest among transit agencies, especially given the fact that operating subsidies are nowhere, where they, nowhere near where they used to be across all levels of government. So uh, excellent change. Thank you very much. Thanks. Comments down on this side? Comments or questions? Sorry. Oh, just similarly, I wanted to applaud the inclusion of a set aside for tribal communities. I think from a, um, a health uh, perspective, those are communities that are often heavily hit on multiple fronts. So it's wonderful to see them um, called out for a set aside in this program. Um, great, really quick question from me. I'm just wondering if, if uh, Louise um, or Lynn, actually, this might be you too. If you could just talk a little bit, we had two comments on the pro-housing policies. Can you talk a little bit about what's being discussed in terms of tracking, sort of the questions we're getting about tracking and monitoring, seeing how the, what the impact of those is on the programs that they're being applied to? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I think they're part of the intention also of putting the criteria in this round is we will see what the response is how much it's used, what kind, what communities are we seeing points awarded to, not awarded to, so we can look at, you know, just with this limited set of policies. In the broader conversation, and I would definitely encourage everyone to look at HCD's framework paper and the survey, there is a specific um, section and discussion around geographic considerations and other implications, sort of, um, implications of this for different types of communities around the state. So I think that is a very active area of conversation and one that needs to be um, addressed and worked through and, you know, and is recognized in this policy framework paper. And then in the ongoing conversations, I think also around, um, to Julia's point on the anti-displacement and the safety and quality of housing is critically important. So um, you know that is a, a topic we continually raise. I think AHSC and TCC both are excellent examples on, on how we've been trying to refine and evolve the anti-displacement components of these programs. And we have definitely been trying to use those um, as we look across other housing programs as well. Um, so I, you know, I do, I think we're, we're, it's very helpful to hear all of the input. And I do think that is something we can look at very closely with this small rollout of the pro-housing policies in these three programs in this round. 
Great, and that's a great reminder too that any displacement is already baked into this program and just encourage folks to look, I think on page five of the attachment here, uh, which talks about that. Yeah. Um, it, when, it would be great to have a report back on some of those learnings at some point. What's the right meeting to do that? When could you do that? Well, applications will be due in February. And so I think just from a competitive standpoint, we probably would wanna package that up with the final award recommendations. Um, I think so that, you know, just so we're not giving glimpses into scoring ahead of time. Um, I mean, we do, well, anyway, so I, I'm gonna say, I think probably to do it in the scoring. There may be other um, pieces though that we can pull in that are more qualitative in the interim, especially as we hear from TA providers who are working with applicants. Um, and so, you know, I can circle back with Ryan and we could come up with a, a plan of how we might be able to give some interim updates. And I don't, you know, we maybe could, we can also coordinate with HCD and IIG mm -hmm. as they're doing, moving forward. Yeah, that was, I was thinking exactly that because we're, we're also putting this into the IIG program and then simultaneously, I think we'll be starting to receive feedback from the framework paper. And I think that um, HCD did a pretty good job, I think, in terms of creating a structure that allows for the, op, the most flexibility so that jurisdiction by jurisdiction, they can essentially choose from different categories to think of what, what pro housing could look like reflective against what their community needs are and the realities of each jurisdiction. So, you know, we really kind of tried to think about like what what kind of levers could you pull that give the the optimal solution community by community and kind of did that from you know the our perspective here but i think that that feedback from the programs is going to be critical and then also we'll be receiving the feedback from the surveys where we'll see as communities begin to think about that paperwork in relation to their experiences and their situation i think we'll get some really good feedback in the next month or two um, and I think that would be a good time to be able to kind of bring the teams together and have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think there's the one thing to bear in mind is that we do have statutorily the emergency regulation process that then will kick off formally with in the summer. And so we do have a kind of a tight time frame to be able to do this. So I think we should just really keep, keep, in, keep track of comments as they're coming and almost have kind of an iterative process mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we're, we're really um, taking that feedback and incorporating it into the emergency regs as they come out in the summer. Thanks, and, and just to commend um, you both actually, but all of you for trying to do something we've been talking about for a long time, which is take a policy recommendation from the governor's office and apply it across a bunch of categories so that there's not a separate set of requirements across each of those categories. That's not that easy to do as we're learning here, but, um, and then trying to do that in a way that sort of regionally and project specific, um, understands flexibility at the project level. It's, it's really challenging. So having a standard set of definitions, but then uh, allowing for flexibility within programs is a really interesting approach. And I think we'll all be really looking forward to seeing how that works out. Um, I, I will say, I think that just from the conversations, we, everything is identical right now. I think as this, as we, as the as the framework evolves and grows, I think more flexibility will be reflected. You know, now you can choose from five policies, and if you look at the framework paper, you'll see it is a much more robust set of options and categories. It also lays out threshold requirements, and so it is. It's a much more comp. It will be a much more um, sort of nuanced and flexible approach as it grows and evolves. Yeah, go ahead. Final comment. Um, so I'm supportive of all the recommended changes. Um, so this is more high level, and it might not be, I should have said this earlier probably, when you said if we had technical questions or more kind of holistic considerations, which is something we don't really talk about when we are considering um, program implementation is how it fits into the bigger picture of our climate goals. Like, for example, obviously I think most people know that Next 10 came out with a pretty sobering report about where we're at for 2030 goals, not 2020, but 2030. And for me, uh, it would be nice to integrate sort of the high level realities with our program implementation and how our programs are, and grants are fitting in. You know, I don't know, I don't know exactly how to do that, by the way, <laughs> so that's not helpful. Um, but <laughs> but some, some way, so also the broader community understands where we're at as a state and Again, I know these uh, programs are um, meant to um, 
obviously help us reach those goals and I, you know, to totally support them, but also like what else needs to happen for us to sort of reach the mission of this organization, right? And so to me, it would just be nice if there were, I, and it also, you know, probably is dovetails into what you talked about first, um, Louise, in the beginning in opening comments about our priorities for 2020. Like what else does the state need to be doing to help ensure that we're reaching the climate goals and making ourselves climate safe and climate ready. Mm -hmm. So in anyhow, that's, I know it's not totally perfect comment. No, time, it's, but. it's, and it's really <laughs> helpful to actually remind us the overarching goals. Wade, you had a comment, I think on that. Yeah, I would just reference, it's, it's my understanding that the Air Resources Board in 2020 is updating the scoping plan, which is really, I view as sort of the master plan to reduce emissions to meet our climate goals. Presumably one um, portion or component of the plan will, will focus on on you know VMT, uh, which is of course a tough nut to crack. So I'm hoping as we uh, move to the uh, scoping plan update in 2020, it will help ground our investments through this program uh, toward the overall climate goals. Thank you, that's a great point. And, and just on that point, I mean, I, I think one of the challenging things, but really important things about the SGC programs is that they're not they're not sort of simple emissions counting programs, right? It's not like we can say, here's the cost benefit analysis of just on emissions. There's all kinds of other things <coughs> happening in these programs, including an integrated approach to housing plus transportation plus urban greening plus, you know, workforce component. Plus. So there's a lot going on. And so how does one value that, right? In a kind of a classic mm -hmm. emissions counting uh, way is a really interesting question because ultimately we know from ARB's report last December that VMT is one of the areas is the biggest challenge for us in terms of why we're not meeting our goals is because of land use change, which is hard to do. So, but it's a great reminder. Thank you, Nicole, on just how does this, this is, these are some of the only programs right now within GGRF that are directly addressing VMT. And so, which is a huge gap in terms of our reaching our goals. So how are we thinking about that? And, and maybe how are we as a council especially with the new legislation that Sloan was just telling us about in terms of transportation analysis. How do we as a council, how, maybe we should be thinking more strategically about that gap uh, beyond the programs themselves, but also about how each of our agencies are thinking about that whole VMT question. I mean, I've, I've, I've often uh, wondered whether, you know, we're making lots of grants, lots of little grants, and then, but, but from the top down picture, are we, are we actually moving things in the right direction? Is the way to do it by, by making all these little grants or is there a need for additional legislation or uh, something else that will, I mean, silver bullets are hard to find, um, but, but um, you know, our approach is gonna take a long time to materialize. Um, and maybe that's just the facts of, of uh, where we are, but, um, I don't know whether it's worth entertaining um, other bigger picture ideas that might might be useful for us. And I don't know where they would come from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Wait, go ahead and then. Well, I'd make two observations, maybe disconnected, but the first is a lot has evolved since uh, Senate Bill 375 passed establishing the strategic, strategic Growth Council. And one of them is the imperative to build more affordable housing in California, given the affordability crisis. Um, so I think what's really exciting about this program is it's really meeting two critical goals of the state, you know, climate, sustainability, but also affordable housing. Public investment is obviously fairly expensive towards the amount of units it can develop. And so we're not going to essentially, you know, invest public investment, um, you know, uh, as the silver bullet solution to affordable housing. So to Bob's point, you know, this... Uh, SGC has really evolved to focus on where we can make investments and reinvest, you know, greenhouse gas funds in building sustainability. But I do think there are other tools, be they, you know, regulatory or, or incentives. And so as we look to really think about the broader smart growth mission towards affordability and sustainability, it's an open question around whether this council should discuss other strategies beyond the investments we now consider. Yeah, that's a great point. Also, I just point people, there was a, an Atlantic article this week about the relationship between the fires and housing affordability, which is something we've talked about up here before, but just the 
people over the last 10 years moving more and more into exurban areas, many of which are well in urban interface areas. And the relationship between that and more structures in those areas and more power lines in those areas and fires is a, a very direct relationship. So this is an imperative, I think, across the state, but it, it is something um, that we should really be thinking about. And, and, and I was thinking when Sloan was pre presenting that new legislation is an interesting moment to think about sort of what is the role of the council? Every single one of us has a relationship to this issue of VMT. It's a huge health issue. Um, it's a huge uh, issue in terms of land conversion, right? And, and ag land, it's a huge issue for housing and transportation. It's a huge air quality issue. It's just every, all, every one of us is involved in it and it's a incredibly hard nut to crack. Um, and, you know, to, uh, to Bob's point, you know, unlike Oregon, we do not have state planning power. So uh, it's uh, hard not to crack with a lot of different pieces needed to think through. Um, so I, I like the idea of us at a kind of council level thinking about that um, beyond the existing programs, but how do we make sure the existing programs are aligned in that direction, which they, they, they mostly are. Um, so bringing it back down from that high level to uh, what are we doing today? Um, and uh, if any further questions, comments on the guideline recommendations. Um, yes. I would Wayne. just move that we adopt the recommendations if there are no more questions. <laughs> second. Yep, multiple seconds. We'll go with Bob's second. Um, I'm just gonna do a, a, a roll call just because roll calls are fun. <laughs> <laughs> we have these, these the, oh, you guys have these things that have like yes and no buttons, but I don't, I don't know if those work, so we're gonna just do a, an actual, we have very cool um, microphones up here. I <laughs> I'm just gonna go for a roll call. Uh, Doug, are you gonna call the roll? <laughs> yes. Approve. Can you turn on your <laughs> so, uh, Lauren? Approve. Lynn? Yes. Secretary Ross? Yes. Kate? Yes. David Kim? Aye. <laughs> yes. Wade? Yep. Yana? Yes. And Bob? Yes. All right. Passes unanimously. <laughs> well, great. Um, thank you, uh, approved. Um, uh, thank you, the recommended council action is approved. And uh, just one more note of thanks to not only the staff for just the sheer amount of time you put into this, but also everyone who commented. Um, you're doing the work of trying to get these projects to happen on the ground and your comments and your uh, engagement with staff really does matter and it really is appreciated and listened to and we are constantly trying to make these programs better. So thank you for all you've done and continue to do. Um, Darwin is coming up to replace Secretary Kim. Hello, Darwin um, from CalSTA. Uh, so going to the next uh, program and big action area on uh, transformative climate communities program and Julia Nagel is presenting and it will be her last time, I believe, presenting to this council. So it's very sad for us to say that because she's been phenomenal. Julia. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm here to present um, proposed round three final guidelines for the Transformative Climate Communities Program. Uh, so here's the contents for today. Just quickly, um, some background on the program. Um, the, the program was established in 2016 and there were two rounds of funding in 2018. Um, this was the first time there was a state program really bringing together all of the California climate investment programs um, and integrating them in a single project area at the scale of a neighborhood. Um, and really in addition to working to achieve greenhouse gas reductions, also having the requirements of health benefits and economic and workforce benefits. Um, and also a focus on the most disadvantaged communities and um, and having them lead the transformation. Excuse me, sorry, I didn't change the slide. <laughs> um, so here's a great picture with Louise at a groundbreaking in Fresno um, for the- uh, You look so Beach. cool. You look like <laughs> men in black or something in that picture. <laughs> 
It was bright. <laughs> Louise is the only one with sunglasses on. It's sunny in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so also just to remind you, uh, the, transformative, the transformative climate communities has several transformative elements um, and plans in addition to the infrastructure projects. There is a requirement around community engagement, workforce development, displacement avoidance, climate adaptation and resiliency for the infrastructure being proposed um, both now and in the future. Also leverage funding requirement to bring additional public and private dollars to the project area and then data collection and indicator tracking. Um, so in our first two rounds, you can see here the awards um, statewide, uh, three, three awards in round one to Fresno, Ontario and the Watts community in Los Angeles and then two awards in round two to Pacoima and Sacramento. Um, similarly, here we have the planning grant awards in both rounds. Um, so the planning grant component of the program is supposed to help uh, communities prepare for all of the requirements in the implementation grant, um, especially getting plans up to date and um, doing some of the initial on the ground community engagement work. Um, so we've awarded about $2.6 million and 15 planning grants in two rounds. In round three, uh, the funding available, uh, the budget allocated 60 million. Um, so we are proposing two awards for 28 point, two implementation grant awards for 28.2 million each and three planning grant awards for 200,000 each. So um, just to give a brief overview of our guidelines update process and proposed changes. Uh, this fall, we held a series of public workshops um, and a webinar. We received 19 written comments and we estimate over 100 uh, attendees at all of our um, engagement uh, events. Uh, stakeholder concerns were in the following categories um, around changing our eligibility um, for the project area. And I'll get a little into that in a little more detail in a minute. Uh, changes to leverage funding requirements, funding for transformative plan elements, and the length of the planning grants. So, of course, we've proposed changes in all of those areas um, that I just said we had comments about. Um, so we are going to get into each of those in more detail. So first, in terms of the project area eligibility, we are um, proposing expanding to the top 10% disadvantaged census tracts up from the top 5% for at least 51% of the project area. The remainder um, will still be from census tracts uh, that are top 25% or AB 1550 low income. We are also proposing um, to allow pl planning grantees from rounds one and two that had unincorporated census tracts um, and that also meet the 10% DAC eligibility um, to apply. And so that uh, falls, the four communities that uh, meet that criteria are listed here, East Los Angeles, Franklin, Stockton, and South Los Angeles. And um, we are, uh, you know, of course, aware of the passage of SB 351 and we'll be thinking further about how to um, incorporate unincorporated areas into future rounds of funding. Um, we are also proposing to increase funding for the transformative elements. Um, so up from 3% previously, we'll have 5% of the grant for data collection and indicator tracking. Uh, awardees can, applicants can propose up to 8% for community engagement and of that 3% can be for displacement activities and uh, anti-displacement activities and um, up to 5% can be for workforce development and economic opportunities. So a total of 18% of the funds can go towards the transformative elements. Um, we are also changing how applicants are able to meet, meet the leverage funding um, requirement and so saying that 40% of the 50% leverage funding um, w must be tied to grant funded projects or transformative plans so be a, a piece of the budget in, uh, in grant funded projects and then the remaining 10% of the 50% can be for standalone leverage projects. 
Um, we're also pr proposing the following changes to eligible strategies, removing the land conservation strategy while allowing urban agriculture and community gardens to still be funded under the health and well-being strategy, and adding a land acquisition um, for affordable housing development strategy, uh, and funds there can be used for the activities listed, land acquisition, land holding costs, fees, um, costs associated with obtaining a ground lease. We also have a few more minor proposed changes, um, just increasing the total points that we'll award from 100 to 200 and changing the planning grant term from one year to two years. We will again offer application technical assistance, um, so to help uh, applicants identify a project area, their program vision, to do financial and budget um, development of projects, um, to think about the integration of projects, um, and assessment of readiness, some mapping assistance, and then uh, ultimately we ask everyone to work with our provider on the greenhouse gas um, reduction quantifications. So our round three timeline is here. Um, as you can see, this fall was um, releasing draft guidelines, um, incorporating public comments. We are proposing um, upon uh, adoption of these final proposed guidelines, hopefully, uh, that we would go out for NOFA um, in next week or, um, and also distribute application materials. Um, have the deadline for the submission of round three proposals be at the end of February uh, and the awards announced in April of 2020. So uh, our recommended action is to adopt the fiscal year 2019-2020 final proposed draft transformative climate communities program round three guidelines. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. I'm gonna do the same thing as on HSC and just do um, technical uh, clarifying questions now, then comments of which I have three and then uh, discussion and um, motion if we have one. Questions on these proposed changes. I have one technical question, which is um, in terms of the proposal to change the planning grants to two years, funding to two years, can you talk about how operationally that works in a program that has annual appropriations that you're not ever totally sure how much money is coming into the program every given year? How do you do a two-year appropriation in that or two-year grant in that context? I think I think I'll, what it is, it's the same way we do our, our five-year implementation grant. It just gives the grantee longer to spend the money. So it, it doesn't, it, it, we, the, what we had heard is it, it's a fair amount of work to get the partners together and do all of the activities in a year. So this just gives a longer time period for the grantee to do the work. That's really helpful. I just wanted to make sure that grantees weren't in a position where they had any uncertainty about the second year oh, of funding. No, the, the money is, it would come from this appropriation. It just gives them longer to spend it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Any other questions? Um, all right. I'm going to start our public comment with Effie Turnbull Sanders from the South Los Angeles Transit Empowerment Zone. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, thank you for moving things along. I might get home for trick-or-treating, so I'm excited yes, about that. Many of us have kids up here, so we're... <laughs> <laughs> um, again, for the record, my name is Effie Turnbull Sanders. I'm the Executive Director of the South LA Promise Zone, otherwise known as the South Los Angeles Transit Empowerment Zone, and I'm representing the South LA Climate Commons Project that received the planning grant uh, last year. Um, we want to laud the staff's efforts to um, revise the um, proposed regulations to include unincorporated areas and also expand the vision. Uh, one comment that we did have was on the um, matter of expanding um, the budget for community engagement activities for the implementation phase, and we understand that the proposed regulations would also include 3% of that budget to go to anti-displacement measures um, or anti-displacement plans. And I think the overview that was given by the executive director on the importance of place-based efforts, collective impact strategies, and building the connective tissue and the um, 
sustainability and resilience of community-based organizations is really important. And looking at kind of some of the toll that it took on some of the organizations to apply for the grant, it's necessary really to, I think, buttress the community-based organizations so that they're not only able to take advantage of these types of grants, but other ones as we start layering in um, these opportunities. And so on behalf of the South LA Community Commons, we would like to um, make a recommendation for the expansion of that 8% to a larger portion. Um, the only way that we're gonna be able to develop resilient communities is to make sure that the community-based organizations that support residents are strong. Um, and this is one way of being able to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for those comments. All right, I'm gonna to move to our next um, speaker or commenter, which is uh, Eddie Moreno from Seha, who has on very cool purple tie. And you were wearing purple gloves back there a minute ago, but they seem to be gone now. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to handle the paper very well, so. <laughs> Happy Halloween um, and uh, good afternoon. Chair members, my name is Eddie Moreno on behalf of the California Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the proposed final uh, transformative climate communities guideline for year three of the program. Uh, we'd also like to thank and appreciate the council and its staff uh, for working so hard with the public to develop uh, strong and effective guidelines for the program. Um, as, as one of the co-sponsors of AB 2722, uh, SEHA has been committed to ensuring the, the high quality implementation of the TCC program and has, has continued to advocate for greater resources for the program. Uh, first, we appreciate many of the changes that have been uh, included in the final proposed guidelines, such as uh, broadening implementation grant eligibility to allow 10% of the most disadvantaged communities, according to the Kyle and Virus Green 3.0, uh, to apply, allowing up to 8% of the awarded funds to be used for community engagement, with 3% 3 uh, 3% of that funding, uh, of that, uh, with 3% of that funding that could be used for displacement uh, avoidance related activities and allowing a number of standalone projects to count towards the 50% leverage requirement. Uh, at the same time, we'd like to share a few important recommendations for the final TCC guidelines uh, regarding uh, disadvantaged unincorporated community DUC eligibility. Um, as many of you well know, disadvantaged unincorporated communities have experienced long histories of disinvestment, discrimination, and neglect, much of uh, which continues today. Uh, however, many of them, such as those located in eastern Coachella Valley and in Tulare County, are also putting hard work into producing amazing transformative local plans and are leading the way by demonstrating community-driven place-based climate solutions in California. So uh, we would like to see the DUCs that uh, receive this, the TCC planning grants in the past to be eligible for implementation grants moving forward. Um, the planning grant process itself is a great way to screen these projects uh, to see whether or not they would have the capacity to carry out a high quality implementation grant. In order for, to better develop guidelines for the DUC eligibility, we also recommend that the council convene a group of experts to define criteria for DUC, DUCs in the TCC, and to include such criteria in the final round four guidelines. We really appreciate the staff's intentionality around DUC el eligibility and look forward to discussing next steps for this process in the, in the near future. For the requirements around displacement avoidance, we hope that the council can work with grantees to ensure that the chosen DAP policies and programs will successfully guard against displacement. We also recommend that the council and the TCC evaluators create a public report on potential displacement impacts, impa impacts related to uh, the project areas that have received TCC implementation grant awards. Thank you so much. I look forward to continuing to work with you on these on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for your work too, um, at Seha. And Julia gets to come back up for the final word on this. Okay, thank you for having me up twice. Um, so thank you again um, to the staff, SGC staff and, and council members. Um, I know we've had a lot of conversations with many of you and we really appreciate um, being able to have an open door and have that um, opportunity to, to really discuss some of these issues in depth. Um, and again, for the record, Julia Jordan with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, so I, I do want to sort of echo a lot of the comments that um, my colleague over at SEHA just made, but um, emphasize a little bit more of sort of our, our interest in the disadvantaged unincorporated communities. 
Um, and as we've you know, discussed with many of you, we really believe that these communities need to be actively included in TCC, um, and also as well as sort of broader programs and investments due to that very kind of clear historical discrimination and land use policies that has you know, over time kind of developed communities that lack some of the most basic infrastructure, um, sidewalks, uh, you know, lighting, very kind of basic things that I think could actually have a very transformative impact, even with smaller amounts of funding. Um, and, you know, there, there's places that, that we work, um, especially in the Eastern Coachella Valley, we've discussed that, you know, they received a planning grant, have put a lot of effort into uh, going through this process and then are not eligible to then do an implementation grant. And a lot of what we're finding is that the uh, Cal Enviro screen will put communities like Thermal or Oasis um, at 20 or 25%, 30% in some cases on the map, um, despite the fact that we know from working directly with communities and community members that um, there are very sort of, you know, in, intense needs that are going on on the ground um, that are not quite captured by a tool like that. Um, so we're really, we're looking forward to sort of working on solutions to this and figuring out ways that we can identify other data, um, other um, methods and modes of coming up with indicators to really, to really um, expand eligibility to really meet those needs. Um, and also to kind of be aware of the places where things like a lack of air monitors in the area or um, maybe a lack of access to emergency rooms um, will sort of make a community look as if it's not uh, scoring quite as high as it might otherwise. Um, so we're really looking forward to working with SGC on creatively thinking about some of these eligibility impacts um, and would also like to urge um, the, the SGC to, to develop a work group to think this through so that we can implement that in the next round, um, especially with the passage of SB 351. Uh, so thank you again so much for your work on this and we're looking forward to continuing in collaboration with you. Thank you so much, great comments. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll let my colleagues ask first, wait. So clearly, um, anti-displacement efforts are are central to the you know the work within these transformative climate communities, and that much is clear. And it seems like the the program is um, recognizes that. I think back to my time uh, working in local government in the Bay Area and the role of community groups, uh, remembering like Podair or Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition, really galvanizing community efforts to prevent displacement. So given all of that, um, just wanted to respond to uh, Ms. Turnbull Sanders' uh, comments and recommendation around ensuring there are adequate resources for community groups within the, within the grant and just interested in staff's perspective on that and whether the resources in the current proposed guidelines are adequate and, and what thinking you've done on that? Yeah, I think um, we saw a little bit in the first two rounds that when we didn't have funding, um, any funding allowed for displacement avoidance activities, which is originally what uh, how it was structured just for community engagement, um, that the displacement work uh, a lot of the plans ended up being proposed to be done by staff of local government or the lead applicant, whether it was a housing authority or uh, city. So um, I think having, you know, e even if it is a sm small amount to start, um, uh, some grant funds that can go towards displacement avoidance, the hope is that uh, it could go more directly to a community group or other kind of um, entity besides the lead applicant um, to do the kind of organizing work and the more the advocacy um, versus I think in, in some cases there was a proposal more around just like analysis um, and having in-kind staff. That's really helpful and, uh, and getting real resources in the community seems critical. So just, just to get a sense of scale, um, like an average overall grant, and then once you apply the percentage, how much would that actually generate uh, that could be provided for those anti-displacement efforts? So let's say if it's a $15 million grant, you said three, is so it 3% cap? In, in this round, it will be two grants of 20, 28, 28, 28 million, million dollars. dollars. Yeah. So up to 3% of that. Um, <laughs> It'd be like several hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and I think just to make sure, you know, we in previous rounds did not 
uh, anti-displacement work was as a leverage was an, a contribution without funding allocated to it. So the the change in this round is to a, allow a portion of the community engagement funds to be applied to doing the anti-displacement work. Yeah, well, I'll just say I think it's a real step in the right direction. I I I'd ask you to focus on how the funding gets spent, and then mm -hmm. you know if it can build the capacity that's really needed. Yeah, thank you. And just uh, adding on to that, also just the question of tracking the efficacy of anti-displacement anti policy, right? Is it actually stopping displacement? And how does that get evaluated and how can we make sure that it's working? Yeah, so um, included in the evaluation plan, the research team at UCLA is looking at all the transformative pieces and doing, um, I think in that case, probably pre-post surveying and then looking at also data, different data sets. Um, it's hard to get down to the level of a neighborhood and to kind of say why people moved if you're not doing, you know, if you're not literally going around and surveying every single household. Um, so they've come up with some innovative ways of looking at that um, and we'll be reporting on it annually. Nicole. Uh, my question would be following up on the Leadership Council uh, question around uh, creating a working group to help evaluate eligibility for unincorporated areas and how you all feel about that idea. I think we think it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> we, like, we like the idea. Did you ask your boss? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we have plans to do that in the next few months. Okay. Yeah. Look, community engagement in action right there. Um, <laughs> I had a question, and it's actually sort of a question for Kelly PA, so Lauren may or may not be able to answer it. Sorry to put you on the spot in your first meeting. Um, but the but it's my understanding that Cal Virus Screen, which Julia brought up, is actually undergoing its own guideline or, or its own reevaluation at some point in the near future. And just asking, would just ask you sort of what the timeline is on that and uh, and you know anything you can say about that. Sure, thanks, Chair. Um, it's my 10th day in this role. <laughs> um, so we are updating Kellen Screen. That process will begin next year. Um, and I would yield time on this to uh, my colleague, Lauren, the director of OEHA, who is giving a lot of thought to the process on that going forward. Um, I would be happy to bring more detailed comments to our council meeting in December. Great. Well, this is sort of an internal like question in terms of a point of order. Um, I had had separate conversations with Julia Jordan, thank you, and had done some thinking on the unincorporated community challenges. And I um, have also spoken with Louise and am really um, heartened and pleased to hear the idea of a work group. Um, I think these issues are complex and really challenging and very important, and so a work group made a, a lot of sort of intuitive sense to me to bring together subject matter experts. Um, as a point of order, I don't know whether to um, adopt a motion separately to endorse the staff's um, direction or uh, direct them to do so. I don't know. I'm going to look at our lawyer here and ask that question. Yeah, uh, if you want to uh, <laughs> direct staff to, to put together a working group around that, that's your prerogative. And I I think they could fold it in to the motion in a, <coughs> in approving the guidelines. As part of the approval that, motion. And then also at direct staff for future, you know, to do that work to inform future rounds. Great, so so folding it into a single motion is okay. Everyone's okay with that? All right. Um, I'm not up in my rules of order. <laughs> I, I know, I, I get confused by the rules. Um, uh, great, we have other questions or comments? So um, I guess, do we have a motion to uh, uh, adopt the, the F FY 2019-2020 final proposed draft TCC program round three, round three guidelines with the addition of the support to build out a work group specifically around the unincorporated communities question? Second. That wasn't a motion. I was I gonna say so move. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, can we do a roll call? Sure, uh, Lauren? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Karen? Yes. Kate? Aye. Darwin? Yes. Nicole? Yes. Wait. Yes. Donna? Aye. And Bob? Yes. It's unanimous. Um, thank you. That was great. So unanimous uh, vote for the TCC guidelines. Really appreciate everybody. Um, 
putting so much thought into this, I mean, one of the reasons these votes go as quickly as they do is because an enormous amount of thought goes into them before they happen with staff and also a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions um, and a lot of advocacy kind of conversations with folks out in the field. So really appreciate all of that work that leads up to these meetings so that we ha are very informed and um, engaged already by the time we're sitting up here, which is great. Um, so we have no general public comment cards um, in front of me. So uh, I don't know if we have any additional comments um, from up here from anybody. Yes, Wade. Well, I'll just reference what Louise uh, reported on in her executive director's report, uh, specifically coming back to the uh, council on really what SGC staff has learned from uh, assessing these place-based investments in Fresno and the Lake Tahoe Basin. And then secondly, this discussion around uh, other strategic priorities for SGC. Uh, I know Jared, uh, if he were here, would, uh, would uh, underscore you know, the, the desire to really understand sort of what are our strategic priorities moving forward uh, for the SGC. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I think the SGC staff has developed some really effective funding programs and I think there's benefit of uh, a public body like this sort of providing oversight of those programs. Um, that being said, it will just be helpful soon into 2020 understanding if that is ultimately the remit of the SGC or if we're also working to use this uh, multi-agency body uh, to coordinate or build strategy uh, beyond just these investment programs. Uh, so I, I, I look forward to, to the staff's recommendation on that and then a public discussion on that as you know early as December. Great, thank you. Great, great point. And I think uh, folding in some of the earlier comments from up here around mm -hmm. sort of how the programs are a critical part of that larger strategy um, and then some of the thoughts that folks had about you know, particularly this whole sort of VMT land use issue and gap, where are the gaps in us reaching our goals as a state and how does the SEC have a unique ability to sort of think through some of those gaps that would be really useful also to kind of take into account in thinking through strategy um, and coming back with some ideas in December. And can I piggyback on that idea and just also um, that conversation to include sort of the the potential role of SGC in addressing these developments and responses to fires, developments in fire-prone regions and response thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just add, recognizing that we're now into November and our next meeting is in December, I don't want to jam staff too much with coming around, coming back with sort of big ideas, but I, I think we're eager to, to, to have that discussion whenever it's appropriate, whether it's in the December meeting or the first meeting in 2020. Thank you. I think we can probably do an update and then I, I think it would probably go into early 2020. Great. And sadly, December is Bob Fisher's last meeting as an SGC member because he is after 10 years, I guess, of involvement stepping down. Um, and so that I think we should do at least some of this discussion in December. So Bob's yeah, wisdom yeah, can be sure. part of the conversation. And we can expect a major policy address at the end of your 10 years, right? <laughs> We will all yield our time to you in the uh, in the December meeting. Um, great. Well, thank you, everybody uh, on the council and in the uh, room for your time on, especially on a on a on a day that's a big day for for a lot of people and those with kids and those without kids. Um, uh, with all of that, barring any further comment, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.